blood in my veins. Blue and one I red, white and blue in my brain. I'm a bulldog born. Bulldog, that's my breed. I was born to follow where the bulldogs lead. Okay, welcome back, everyone, to Inside the Kennel Podcast. We've got Dougie Hawkins today. We've got Maddie on the other side of the Zoom. Maddie, welcome. Who we got on today? I oh, forgot. Fantastic. Well, welcome, Dougie. Um, Doug, it's Doug's uh, one of his favourite teammates, I imagine. It's uh, it's the amazing Tony Liberatore. Wow. Matty, Paul, you hit it on the head. Matty, you hit it on the head. This bloke, he, he, was, he was my favourite player to play footy with because you know what? Again, a bit like Clay Smith, more liberal than probably Clay, if that's in fairness. Uh, you'd go to war from you go you, if you're in the trenches. I'll say this, Matty and Paul. If I was in the trenches in the war, and it was my turn to go to sleep, and Libra was going to look after me, he, he he'd look after me. He would look after me, and I'd make sure that I'd get through it, and he would get through it. In the trenches, this bloke was the best in the business. Yeah, wow. And you know what he was? He gave 120 percent every time he stepped over that white line. And if he got beaten, you know what it was? He wasn't good enough on the day. Because he, he wouldn't be the fact he never had a crack. Because he had a crack every time. Tony Libertore stepped over that white line. He, he had a crack. And he's one of my favourite players. But there's a bloke who was, you know what, five foot, what is he? Five, yeah, 164 six, centimetres. He, you know, he's uh, the same size as my nana. Yeah. <laughs> Would he get drafted now? Probably not. Well, you know, this Would is he? the interesting thing, isn't it? Because he, he started off at North Melbourne. And, yeah. um, you know... You, you look at recruiters these days, we've got, there's a history of champion small players. You know, we've got Caleb Daniel at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, there was Boomer Harvey at North Melbourne. I don't understand yeah. why the, you know, recruiters are, are, are not, you know, not always choosing them just because of their height. You know, Tony was an out and out champ. What happened to him at North Melbourne for them to let him go, Doug? Yeah, Matty, man, I, re- I really don't know, uh, Paul. I can't tell you that. I, I know when he arrived, must have been around the mid late eighties, eighty eight, eighty seven, eighty eight. I think it was eighty six, was it? Yeah, yeah. And, and and when he did arrive, um, I think under the Mick Mouldhouse, he may have got the impression Mick maybe that he was a, a wet tracker. Does that make sense? That he was good in the wet, like yeah. he was probably yeah. more better player in the wet than on the dry track. And um, mm. and I've just got, I had that feeling about him uh, that that Mick may have felt that way as well. And um, and, and certainly, you know, on a wet track, he was a fantastic player. But on a dry track, he's a, he's a great player as well. And, and, and as you lead into 89, remember the club was going to merge? We are going to merge with Fitzroy. And, and Mick, that year, I think towards the end of 89, uh, Mick and the club said to Libba, listen, I think your time's up. Wow. You, know, you might have to give that. You, you might have to um, uh, think about going to another club or you're going to move on or retire or what it may be. And then... When the club was going to merge and we survived, Mick obviously got the job at, at West Coast Eagles. Terry Wheeler took over. And that, and there it is. Can yeah. you believe this? Yeah. 89, he's gone. Libba is gone. He's not going to play AFL footy. He's finished. And the next year, what's he going to do? He takes Charlie home. He wins the Brown Lake. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It doesn't. And I remember sitting with Libra in, in the in the gymnasium. I said, "He said, Hawk, I'm done. I'm going to go. I'm gone. I'm, I've got to move on." I said, "I said, I mean, I'll never get it." I said to him, "I said, listen, Wheels is coaching. Hang in there, because I reckon, mate, he'll give you a crack. He'll give you a go." He said, "Mate, you really reckon?" I said, "Mate, I reckon Wheels will give you a go." And the rest was history. So, so, so Dougie, are you telling me this is after the merger happened that um, that you had this conversation with him? Hundred percent. You could. We asked him in the gym. I said to Libra, I said, mate, don't give up. Don't, you know, don't yeah. walk away because Terry Will has taken over and I reckon he's going to give you a crack. Dougie, and give if, him a if crack. Anyone's gonna, if there's ever going to be a like player, Terry Wheeler Loved was him. a very hard man at the footy, wasn't he? So he's going to like, he's going to like or admire Libra. Yeah, just fa- fantastic, Paul. You're right. And uh, uh, again, that year in 1990, he was just sensational. You know, and remember... You had your likes of Brian Royal and Tony McGuinness running around too as well, uh, you know, with Liver. So he's up, he's in, the, in that mix of real quality, um, you know, particularly McGuinness in speed, not as much as Choc. Choc had speed too as well, but just that great footy now, yeah. uh, as did McGuinness had. And, of course, Liver had to play in that midfield with those, those blokes, you know what I'm trying yeah. to say. 
Dougie, what were his strengths as a player? Is he was because he was just a, a kick sort of player, wasn't he? So his crumb and kick. What was his strengths? I, th- I think his strengths was his just an ability to win the footy in tight situations, and, and when it was real hard and tough, and and uh, j- just in that real closeness, he was just so hard to knock over. He had he had great ability to um, um, just win the footy. His kicking wasn't. Super, he wasn't a great kick, and he wouldn't be mind me saying, saying that he was never a great kick. Uh, but just his ability to win that loose footy, that loose footy hardness and toughness. I remember so many times after the game, he had cuts and cut eyes, and <laughs> and then, and you know what, too, boys, we all know this. He had to change his game as he got older mm. and slowed down, he had to become a tagger yes. and survive. And you know what, he survived again, yes, yeah, Four or five the... years as a tagger. He adapted, didn't he? And that's that's incredible. And and I guess he polarised a lot of other opposition supporters just because he got underneath oh. the skin. You know, we know Matty Knights. <laughs> so, Matty, Paul, they hated him. The opposition hated him. They they the supporters hated him. The players, the opposition players hated him. And you know what? I loved him. <laughs> I loved Libba. We all love Libba. All the Footscray players and Western Bulldogs players, we loved playing footy with Libba because we knew what we were going to get. And and you know what? They would call his names. You know what? That would make him go even harder and better. He loved it. He said, Hawkey, you have to call on me? Can you have the crowds call on me? He goes, oh, I don't give a shit on that. <laughs> he, <laughs> it inspired him. That kicked him on even more. You know, call him those those names we're not allowed to use anymore. <laughs> he, 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 didn't give, he didn't care one inch. He didn't care one inch. Sometimes you wonder what the opposition do, don't you? When they motivate the op- they motivate yeah. motivate the uh, the opposition in playing better. Well, you're right, Paul. You're right. You don't stir liver because guess what? He goes in another gear. <laughs> he's already gone in the fifth gear. He's got six <laughs> gears. This bloke. Uh, and I don't it know just what made it tougher. The, liberato- the liberatore is because you know his son is pretty much the, you know cut from yeah, the same son. cloth, yeah. and um, you know he just goes hard at it as well, and he's just loved universally as as well, Tom. And um, now I just wanted to. This was. After you re- had retired, Doug, but you know, I, I, I dare say you've uh, you were there on this on this day, the preliminary final in 1997, and um, you you probably saw it from the crowd. Did he kick that goal against the Crows, or was it a point, as it was called by the goal umpire? Yeah, that's a good one, Matty uh, Paul. I think I, I I actually I was doing radio for Triple M, oh. uh, and I was doing Triple M radio and. Uh, I, I looked, once he kicked it, I looked at the way he reacted. And when he jumped straight up like that, to me, that's a goal. For me, it's a goal. You know, it looked like the board swung after it went through the goals. It looked that way to me. And uh, we, I think in Triple M, we all called it a goal. And when it wasn't, it, 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 I, I just reckon it flattened them a little bit. Is that a fair call? And they were coming, weren't they? The Crows, they were coming. Oh, and, uh, not uh, not Andrew Jarman, Darren Jarman. Darren Jarman. Uh, and then McLeod. And he, was it McLeod? Was it McLeod? Then yeah, it was McLeod. That they, they were um, uh, they were certainly coming. And I could just feel they were coming, and we just lost that little bit of momentum when the umpire didn't allow that goal for Liver. That's yeah. one of those difficult days there, Dougie. Where you talk about the mudlark. He's in yeah, his element the there, there, isn't he? Yeah, you know, he, <laughs> he 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 loved it, and you know what we got to remember. Any any young man or young boy who wants to play footy, and you say to yourself you're too small, get a get a video of this bloke's highlights of his football career, see how big he is, and and he would be a perfect role model for any young boy out there who wants to play footy and think they're too small. Because guess what, you're not. Because if Liver could do it, you can do it. And the Liber- great thing, and Dougie, I think we've mentioned this before, where he's still, I believe, he's still playing footy, and we'll confirm this when we have a chat with him, but. Uh, and he's still playing as tough and as ruthless as he did in his prime. <laughs> Boy, he'd be he'd be the same. Like, he's got one. He's only got the one gear. And that's a hundred mile an hour. And you can imagine him playing in the over fifties or whatever it is. Yeah. Over fifty four. Well, there's an old saying, Dougie, in Masters Footy when I played. It says we yeah. all have to go to work on Monday. I don't think that rule would apply to him though. I don't think he'd, he'd give a damn about that old saying. <laughs> He's still fit, boys. He's still super fit. I, I see Liver a little bit, and we talk. You know, every now and then we have a good chat together. And uh, he's one of my favourite players to ever play footy with again, and probably the favourite, if that no. makes sense. In the way, the way he went about his and prepared himself. He was a professional. He was a pro, and every every bit of ability in his body 
he got out of him. He got out of himself. What did you learn from him, Dougie? You talk about preparation. A lot of those really exceptional players, including yourself, did those little extra things. What did he do that you knew that you knew about? Well, just 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 his way he prepared himself. He, his work to boys in the gym was good. He really worked hard in the gym, and he's a good role model for these younger kids coming through. Where I wasn't a big gym worker, I wasn't a great gym worker. I, I just wanted to. Re- I mean, I was strong enough. I felt to play my role. And I was never a great um, a gym worker, but Libba in the gym was a fantastic role model for these younger players coming through to, to see what it was like to get to where he's got to and the work he had to do. Yeah. Fantastic he, gym worker. He, his brother, Fred, is a gym junkie, isn't he? He just loves it in his wrestler. And, you know, so, so yeah. it's, in, it's in the Italian genes. Yeah, no, no 100%. And, uh, you know, here's a, here's a bloke again, you know, it wasn't a super kick. Won a Brownlow medal, won a best and fairest. Um, fantastic player, fantastic player, Liver. Great to play with. Loved him, loved him. Well, thanks so much, Doug. We've um, we've got him waiting in our virtual uh, waiting room right now. So, uh, ladies and gents, thank you so much, Dougie, as always. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, he's more famous on Barclay Street than Jimmy Wong and Franco Cozzo. Let's welcome Bulldog Dynamo champion Tony Liberatore. Welcome to Inside the Kennel, Tony. Oh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Now, listen, I must apologise. Uh, you've been known to frighten and intimidate your opponents across 283 game career, but it seems even my co-host Paul's ducking for cover. We're hoping to get him back. Um, but in the meantime, I get to go one-on-one with you, Tony. So I'm looking forward to this. I'd Love to start by just asking you in your own words, how would you describe yourself as a player for those who never got to see you play? Um, oh, look, I guess probably a um, hard-working player. Um, never gave up. A uh, bit of a battler, I guess, in some ways, but um, did it the hard way. And, and just, um, you know, I was lucky to, you know, play with some really great players and um, I never gave up and, the game evolves as well, so the skill levels change a fair bit. It's got obviously got better, and it's a lot more full time these days. So, um, just a hard working player who um, who gave everything for the for the uh, for his teammates in the club. Yeah, you certainly did. Tell us a little bit about as Tony as a junior. So, how did you um, how did you get involved in footy? Um, you know, and who was the sort of earlier supporters in your career to to help you? Um, yeah, look, I played for a side called Brunswick City in the Essendon District Football League. Um, they're no longer around. Um, I ended up playing under-19s football. I got um, back in those days, they were probably, I got scouted to play under-19s and I sort of progressed from there. Dennis Pagan was probably my under-19 coach, first under-19 coach, and I learned a hell of a lot from him. And he was um, a real mentor and um, it was he was tough. He was a straight tutor and... Um, um, yeah, so he was probably someone who, who I you know progressed to play as a seventeen year old with the under nineteens and and then played three years there, won in won a premiership as a nineteen year old and played a few games in the seconds at at North. Um, but then nineteen eighty six it was. Um, I, I was lucky enough to win the Morris medal, which is under nineteen comp, best in the comp. Um, but yeah, I was just a junior player who just was quite tenacious and you know. Had a real appetite to win the ball and and um, yeah, just really played to my strength, which was you know in and under and obviously tackling. Yeah, well, tackling is uh, is seems to be in the uh, Liberatore DNA, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> that's for sure. So so you arrive at North Melbourne, you win the Morris Medal, as you say. Um, I think that was in eighty four, wasn't it? And uh, how yeah. is it that somebody who wins the, the competition best and fairest ends up not staying at the club? Because surely, you know, they were what they saw the promise in you. How did it come? What was the conversation for you to leave North and uh, and wind up at Footscray? Well, yeah, actually, don't leave North, but they, they just um, they send out a list, or they I can't remember. They might have rang me up and said, you know, look, we just think there's other players ahead of you. And I think back then, you know, the Cracker Brothers were there. There was. Angela Petragli, who I played with eventually. Um, there was Mark Arsiri. There was Kim Hodgman, a couple of old players there that um, played a lot of footy for, for North Melbourne. So, yeah, so I just played under 19s and um, I was obviously devastated when, you know, I thought I was good enough to, to go to the next level. But, look, I wasn't the greatest kick. I wasn't um, um, the tallest player, but, you know, I could find the ball. And I um, My skill level was nowhere near 
Um, I probably wouldn't have got a gun in, in today's footy. I don't know um, because my skill level and skill level wasn't as uh, pronounced back then. Like we didn't, it wasn't a big part of the game. Um, just get it and kick it type thing, and, and then, be, then obviously the game changed and got better. So yeah, so so you wind up at Footscray, and you know you talk about these fantastic players at North, the Cracker Brothers. Uh, Siri, etc. You, you arrive at Footscray when Tony McGuinness has just been drafted in. You've got Choco Royal, Dougie Hawkins in, in, in the engine room. So it doesn't get any easier for you to uh, to crack in for a game, Tony. What? Um, yeah. What look, like? look I, I remember um, I rang up a few clubs and sort of said, you know, I rang St Kilda, uh, Footscray, back then we'll call Footscray, and Hawthorne. And those are three clubs I thought they might need small players. And little did I know they were going to draft, you know, um, Tony McGuinness and um, yeah, I mean they had Brian Rawl and um, and it was funny because I was you know eighty six. I I trained you know back then you know anyone can come off the streets and pretty much train with an AFL side. I mean obviously if you played maybe you know at a lower level of AFL or whatever, if you had to work hard and put the hard yards in, um, and I just wanted that opportunity just to, just to get another chance and play at an AFL club and. It meant a lot to me just going down and training, and you know, I wasn't the greatest kick, but I had to help, help, had to work a lot on that part of my game, and and lucky enough, I played about four games at the end of the '86 season because I I still would dominate reserve grade footy, and um, but never really got a proper look in until probably when the club was going to merge in '89 '90. Yeah, right. So. So when you arrived at the club, because obviously you won the '86 and the '88 Gardner Medal for best and fairest in the reserves. You find yep. your feet there. Who were the sort of the players who helped guide you and mentor you at, at the club when you arrived at the Dogs? Oh, look, you know, oh, I'm obviously, you know, like Doug Hawkins is a very revered figure. Like he was, yep. so 86 to 88 was Rick Kennedy, yeah. And um, Rick was a bit of a, a feared figure. So it was guys like Peter Foster and guys like that. Um, it's funny, you know, like I just really enjoyed playing with the, with the reserves. And, you know, we had a really strong group. We we uh played the prem played the premiership in nineteen eighty eight under Rod Austin in nineteen eighty six. We were um grand finalist runners up to Carlton under Emmett Dunn and um I really enjoyed um the second sort of coach's role was a little bit um no like just really encouraging type coaches and they 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 were fantastic. But I just love playing with guys, you know, and we become really close, you know, guys, you know, there was, oh, geez, the list goes on, Zeno Tatsaris, you know, uh, Greg Hitch, um, Craig Somerville, um, uh, Mark Cullen, um, you know, there was so many, and, you know, that we're always in and out of the seniors, and but we, we had a really good time off the footy ground because as a, you know, you probably, I was probably, you know, 19, 20, 21, and, and we just we we'd have so much fun going out afterwards, going out to clubbing and you know, the grain store tap and places like that, and and we just just really had a good time. And um, you know, you'd always hope that you'd play senior football, but um, you'd be you'd be so disappointed when you didn't get picked on a Thursday night. I remember used to doing sit ups with Mick Malthouse and impressing him to send me if he could beat me like we'd do, and he was really fit, um, and no one would do sit ups with him, but I I threw the ball a lot with him and thinking, oh, maybe I might be able to get a game. He knows how fit I am. But, you know, there was certainly a knock on my kicking. There wasn't a knock on my fitness because I could sort of run all day. But, um, yeah, I could win the ball, but, I, you know, I just had to use it a little bit better. And, um, yeah, so then, you know, the 1989 season, there was a bit of an upheaval with the – or the 90 season with the merger. And, and Terry Wheeler took over as coach, but he was our reserve coach in 89. And I found him to be really, um, really a good guy. But – in saying that, he couldn't guarantee many games, especially the start of the 1990 season. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I was probably going to leave the club because I thought, well, no one's, I'm not going to get, I've played uh, 16 games in four years. And I thought, well, I probably won't get a, get a look in. And, you know, um, unfortunately, there was a guy named Ron James who was probably earmarked to, to play senior football as a 16 year old. He played, uh, at Williamstown, and he was an up-and-coming young player, but tragically he passed away um, in a skiing accident in 89-90, that pre-season. And then, um, yeah, so, like, the pre-season, 
I thought I was going to leave and then I had a chat to Doug Hawkins and he sort of said to me, you know, like the boys love you. I'm, I was popular amongst the, the group. I mean, and they were, you know, we were really tight and, we, and the reserves great for footy. Like, I mean, when you win a premiership in the reserves, it's, it's it means a lot, like especially when the seniors can't win it. And we won in 88 and that was a really good, good feeling. And then I became captain of the reserves, uh, 88, 80, uh, 89, I think for, uh, and I only played one game, and I thought back then when you're captain of reserves, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I think you'll uh, you've got to uh, you know it's it's let's move on after that. And yeah, and then I was lucky enough just to get one last game in the 1990 season practice matches, and Terry Wheeler took over as coach. There still was no guarantees, and then I played the last practice match, and then. Um, you know, I got got my opportunity round one against St Kilda, and that was a big day because the club was going to merge, and a lot of supporters came out. And we lost to St Kilda, but we played really good. Well, I, I kicked the goal, and um, like we, I think we lost by eight or nine goals, but I, I did quite well. Probably about seven or eight in possessions, kicked the goal, and I thought I'd get dropped for sure round two because I, you know, I don't, didn't think they had much confidence in me. But, but wheels actually. I'll never forget he sort of said after that round one game, he said, we're, the whole team's going to stay the same for round two. Straight after the game, he said, and we're going to we're going to uh, play the same same team and we're going to beat Sydney in Sydney. We've never beat them ever in Sydney, this club, uh, 1990 season. And uh, I, I had a breakout game, kicked three goals, I think. And um, and then the confidence that I got from that and, from the, and this whole playing group was great because we were just, Wheels was a real uh, – oh, he was such a uh, positive influence, um, not only in my career, but also the whole playing group. And we learned a little bit more about the footy club because we didn't under, I didn't really understand much history of the club. And then, you know, he'd bring guys down like Georgie Bissett, who helped me a lot. Um, he helped the midfielders and the forward pocket forward players. And then you had Bernie Quinlan. He, he was – back then, there was only a senior coach and reserve coach. And Bernie Quillen came down and helped the forwards out. And Bones McGee came down and helped the defenders. And Gary Dempsey came down and um, helped the uh, the rucks and the talls. And um, it was really good because once a week it was designated just for us. I think it was a Monday Monday night, I think it was, and, and or Tuesday night. And he, we would just solely work with those people. And the, he wouldn't even coach. He'd just walk around and observe like a bit of a policeman and see what was going on and see how he... He had so much uh, respect and um, what's the word for it? Confidence in those coach or those people who, who came down once a week and helped us out, regardless of their age. Um, and it gave us, you know, like I remember Georgie Bissett. I'd be out on the track with him for for hours and hours after training, and it would be like eight nine o'clock at night, and I wanted to turn the lights off. And he'd <laughs> teach me how to do drop kicks and things like that. He wanted me to do a drop kick in a game. I was like, I was too scared to do that. Um, but um, I do them at training, and you know it was fun. You know, like it, it's. Um, but yeah, we we you know we I think we just missed out the finals in ninety nine season, and I was like my confidence just grew with Georgie, who was you know one of my mentors, and he helped me so much, and obviously Wheels as well. Um, what yeah, a, then, what a difference that makes, isn't it, Tony? For for somebody like Wheels to come along and just give you that that continuity and say, actually, you've got we're going to keep the team the same because prior to that, I guess with Mick. You were describing you played 16 games or whatever it was in four years in and out, you know, yep. you're not knowing and you're, you're playing on hope, I guess. And and yeah, yeah. and suddenly that belief clicked in and, you know, yeah. you played the season of your life. Yeah, I always believed in myself regardless. Um, I mean, even though I miss, I wouldn't play seniors at all from, you know, you know especially the 89 season. Um, I knew I could play at the highest level, but, but Wheels was, was fantastic. I mean, he... A lot of things happened in '89, especially you know the the the, the merge and um, if it, just to let you know, if it, if it wasn't for Irene Chatfield, I don't think we would have a footy club, and mm-hmm. I don't think she gets the recognition that she much deserves because she was the one who um, she talked to her one day. Um, hopefully, you have doing doing the future if you haven't, because her story is quite amazing, and um, um, if it wasn't for her. Yeah, I know Peter Gordon was an important part of the jigsaw puzzle, but but Irene was the one who who didn't want to let, let our club die, and, and she was just a local supporter, lived across the road, and um, 
and the club meant so much to her. So since then, obviously, I've, I've learned a little bit more. But it, Wheels was great because he brought a lot of history at the footy club. And I know the boys are doing their talking a little bit about history. You know, I know the launch was, was a big thing about the history of the club, uh, which Bevo wants to instill in the in the younger players especially. But um, history is a really important part of, of any organisation, whether it's sporting clubs or businesses. Um, but, yeah, because he, he, you know, and, you know, we'd sit around campfires and talk to old guys who were, you know, like Normie Ware and... Um, you know, John Schultz, and I know John's still involved in the club, which is absolutely fantastic, but, and learn a little bit a bit more about the culture of the club and the place. And, you know, it was always working class with Scray. And, you know, it's sort of, I know, no, no, it's a, more of a, a maybe a, uh, a uh, younger family, yuppies and what have you, like alternative people live there now, but it's still an amazing place. And it's, you know, and it's great to, I mean, you know, Tom's still Tom lives in Footscray, and I, I I drive around the places and I see how much it's changed. And but then other things haven't changed, and you just you just sort of, you know, you drive there every single day, you know, for work or for footy footy training. But it wasn't really work, but um, it's it's a great it's a great place, and it still is. And I'm glad they to preserve the the ground and they've made it, um, you know, uh, an important place for for people to to come and gather, especially. Uh, Footscray because they were the people who saved the club. You know, like I, we, I wouldn't be played footy if, if it wasn't for people like Irene and the supporters who did so much for the club. And it, it just will never go. I'll always remember that because that was such an important. The people saved the club, and you know, I'll, 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 I don't think you'll ever see that again. Well, isn't it incredible, Tony, that you know, in, at the end of '89, as you say, on October the third, you know, we we would merged with Fitzroy. You know, so. Yeah the playing group that would have become split and, you know, the chances of yeah. retaining your position would have been, you know, slim to none maybe. And you may have gone into that pre-season drive. Who knows what, where your career would have headed. But um, yeah, is it that a person who was virtually on a scrap heap has had this meteoric rise and ends up taking Charlie home, you know, 12 months later? How does this happen? Uh, I, I was in shock to be quite honest. I, look, I worked really hard at the footy and, and you know, I, you know, and my other, you know, first mentor I had was Dennis Pagan, and his famous line is, "The harder you work, the easier it gets." Mm -hmm. And he just instilled that in me, and I just trained and trained and trained until, you know, I, you know, kicking wasn't my my strength, and I just and Wheels taught me that you, your strength has to be whatever your strength is in football, make that a real big part of your game. Like if you're if you're a really good tackler, or a good in and under player, a good handball, or a great kick and he's sort of so far ahead of his time wheels that, you know, look, we had almost like job descriptions and, you know, my role, if, if I was going to get 30 possessions a game, it's my mine would be 12 kicks and 18 handballs or, you know, like not, not the other way around, but, you know, he'd sort of say, you've got to give it to Leon Cameron who the, who are the outside beautiful kicks of the footy or the Simon Atkins and guys like that. And, um, it, it just made, he sort of sip and fly footy a little bit for us. Um, but a more passionate man, um, I've never been. I've seen it at. I've been at the club for such a long time, you know. And even, oh look, I'm not involved in it now. But obviously, I'll go watch Tom play. But um, in my time, there's never been a more passionate uh, man about the club than Terry Wheeler, and he was an incredible influence on me. And and you know what? Like I, I was just, you know, you, you got to make your own luck in footy. And, to be able to win it when the Brownlow and after being the captain of the reserves the year before and only play one game, I always remember Bernie Quinlan interviewing me after the game and I was, I was sitting in a room with cameras everywhere. And uh, um, it's like when you sort of see those rock stars sitting in a corner and everyone's clicking and flashing the lights and cameras and whatever. And Bernie yelling out, you know, you're the best ever liver, the best ever Brownlow medalist. I said, take it easy, man. <laughs> you're like, but you know, I I, I won't always remember saying I I, I work so hard at I, I wasn't there to, to win a brown. I was there to just to play senior footy and a regular senior footy and and every game I felt like in the nineteen ninety season because I I was always in, I only played you know eighty eight eighty nine I think two games two senior games I just felt every game was my last game and it was a real uh, you know if I 
if I had a mediocre game, I'd, I'd be worried that I'd get dropped, even though I probably had a you know a few credits in the bank. But yeah, I just you know it was it was just like just had to just it had to make sure that every game I did I had to do everything possible to win, and you know, and every game well, we didn't win every game, but um, I just wanted to make sure that you know I, I played my part and did my role and. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to to continue on that from years to come. And then obviously, missing the last three games with my knee, um, that was a concern because I didn't really think that I'd ever be able to come back. Um, I just knew I'd come back better than ever. Like I knew um, that my knee would hold up, and I was really, you know, I had a really good surgeon, David Young, who's an amazing person and still is, and he helps the club out a lot these days. And he just reassured me that your knee will be fine and you'll be stronger than ever. And, and um, yeah, and I'd continue that on 91 onwards. Well, so you came back after 14 weeks, <laughs> is that right, Tony? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I can't specifically remember, but um, oh, that was, sorry, that was my second knee. Like I had two knees. The 1990 season, it happened, the, I think it was the third last game. Oh. So I missed the last three games and then I hung on and won the Brownlow by a vote. Yes. But '97 was a, was a year when I came back um, after a, a Rico, and, and it was a little bit different. So not '97, '98. Sorry, um, it was a little bit different in '98 because it was sort of like thirty odd, thirty one. I think I was. I can't remember, but um, it was like, um, well, I've got to, I've, you know, we you're there to win. A, you want to win a premiership, and that's all. That's all that matters. And, and I wanted to come back and, you know, I had to sign, sign a waiver to say, if you do your knee again, that's it, your career's over or whatever. And so I was prepared to do anything I could just to, to play in a premiership. Of course. So, so in 1991, you come back from this knee, Rico, you're feeling, you know what, I can do, I'm invincible here. I've won the brown low. Um, and you come back and you back it up with by winning the Charles Sutton medal. Um, you yeah. know, what an incredible achievement that was. You, you recognise how amazing, you talk about the history of it, how symbolic that is for a club that down and out, You've almost replicated that and resurrected yourself in just such an incredible way. How how proud of you to, to look back at that, are you, Tony? Yeah, it, it's it's great. Obviously, it's um you know part of you know like I, I just felt like I was a little bit like Footscray, you know, like down and out, got to merge. We come back, win the Brownlow, and then you know I start playing some good footy. The side starts becoming better, you know. Then you know it's Terry Real in '92. We got to. A, the finals, the first probably year we played finals, and and um, Scott Wine won the Brownlow, so which was a greater thrill for me to see, him, to see him win it because you don't like when you're winning an individual award. It's it's not so more about you; it's more about you know, yeah. I get greater pleasure in in my teammates winning um, major awards because you can enjoy yourself a little bit more on the night. Whereas when you win it, you're in a bit bit of shock and not sure what to do um, back. In 1990s, but um, yeah, so it was it was great, and uh, yeah, then we were lucky enough to play a few more finals after that. So tell us a little bit about '92 before we move on. Um, '92 was you know the first year since 1985 that we'd made finals. It's a long time between drinks for for bulldog supporters like myself and some of the older folks. You know yeah. that was an incredible ride that year. Can you tell us a little bit about how that year unfolded and uh, and ended? Sadly. Yeah, look, I think we, we I think I'm not can't remember clearly, but I think we lost both finals, if I can remember. I don't know, you might be able oh, we to played the finals. finals. We we played Geelong, then we then we defeated St Kilda and then we played Geelong. Sorry, that's right. We would beat St Kilda at Birthfell Park. That's right. So we played the we we lost Geelong the first one, I think. Yeah. Is that right? I can't remember. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we played uh St Kilda, we beat them and then I think Danny yeah. Delray kicked the bag. Danny um, kicked eight. I think he may have had six or seven at half time, and we went in. I think with a couple of goals up and without tail. Well, you know, we yeah, had our tail well, up, and, didn't we? Um, yeah, I just I think we just ran out of puff, and like it was just um, I think that all the whole finals things probably got 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 to us a bit. Um, um, in probably our first final series. Um, and yeah, we sort of went crashing out a bit, but we did win one final, which Wheels was really wrapped about because. Like you said, we had one month since eighty five, and and then you know we're supposed to back it up the year after, but then I think we went 
we didn't do too well, 93. Yeah, well, no, there was a bit of a changing of the guard, wasn't there? Because Fozzie oh, okay. and Choco left and, you know, there was, it was, I guess we're up and down. And 94-5, we made finals. But I guess Alan Joyce um, replaced Wheels um, and then ultimately Terry Wallace came and replaced Alan Joyce. So yeah. it was an evolving time at the club. Do you remember that time in your role as a sort of a senior player and, and your influence at, at that time to, to create stability? Yeah, it was it was a real shock for us that Wheels got sacked um, mm. uh, because he was he was such an important figure for me, but also for the playing group, and we all loved him. I mean, obviously there were some players who probably thought they were probably hard done by, but I still don't know why why they why he got moved on. But and you might be able to tell me that. But and then um, maybe we, they were looking for someone who with a bit more sustained success. A coach has, has won a premiership and. Alan Joyce came through, I think, in the 94 season, if I'm yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. And uh, how long did he coach? One year or two years? Yeah, he coached until midway through 1996. And that's when um, Bill, that's when Wallace sorry, took over midway through. And he was, I think he, yeah. Plough was the reserves coach at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Oh, I, was, I think a lot of the players lost a bit of confidence in, in Alan. And um, I think we made a few final series, but. But I think he he thought that maybe the, he'd lost the playing group, um, and yeah, and, and then we uh, Terry Wallace took over, uh, and then ninety seven was was an incredible year, and uh, we had a really poor year ninety six, and then he took over ninety seven. We just trained and trained, and we were never trained that hard in our lives. But um, yeah, he was hell bent on us, you know. Like it was important for us just to. Yeah, he probably thought our, our, you know wanted us to be a real physical side, mm. which we were, and you know sides were you know I, I think opposition sides would be in '96 thought oh, sorry our preseason in '96 we trained really hard and they laughed at us and they thought oh you guys we trained way earlier than any other side it was so tough training in '96 that we the ground was getting redone I think and we were trained at a RAF base uh, we'd be all over the place and we didn't have any sponsors. Again, we were down on our knees, and I don't know if, if we were viable to, to keep going in '96. Uh, and then '97, we just, you know, we just took everything before us, and we become, a, I reckon, the most feared side in the competition. And um, how we never want to, how we never got got there to the grand finals, got me beat. But you know, so many things on that day, being up so much, um, and then. Losing to the end. <laughs> we, we wouldn't be able to talk about it, would we? Had we have not won the 2016 grand final, um, I don't think we could even revisit, think of revisiting that uh, the preliminary final in 97. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've mended a little bit. Can you can you talk us through that that particular day? Um, and and you know we'll we'll certainly get to the your left foot snap um goal behind. Um, but but I'd like you to talk us through a little bit of that that last quarter and um, how close we were. Oh look, it, you know, look, we're, we're well up at half time, and, and Adelaide we, we weren't playing well, and and then obviously uh, Darren Jarman entered, you know, the last quarter, and just, he just did his stuff, and you know, like uh, we we just we just couldn't stop him. He was, you know, like the you know the ball was coming out of the middle a little bit towards the end, and I can remember, it. but then you know we had our chance early in the last quarter. It was my famous point, <laughs> uh, which we all thought was a goal, and then. Uh, we had so many other opportunities. I think Mark West ran into open goal and missed. Um, Jose hit the post. Yes. <laughs> oh, my yeah, God. And, you know, and obviously the other one, which doesn't get a lot of air play, which surprised me, but um, I think it was Paul Hudson and Chris Grant. They, they were waiting for the ball to bounce up and it just trickled out of bounds. And they were, they were both looking at each other who was going to get the ball. So that there happened. 90 probably. seconds left on the clock at that stage, Tony, and um, we were trailing by three points. And when Granny picked it up... Yeah. He was about three metres out and Hutto, you know, was just behind him. They were kind of, you know, they, if they had their moment again, I reckon they would have kicked that 99 times out of 100 between them. Yeah, they, they just, I think they just looked at each other and said, who's going for the ball? So, um, <laughs> yeah, that was that was devastating. Was obviously, you know, like, you know, um, and I've got no doubt we would have beat St Kilda because we had the wood on them and um, Adelaide were incredible. Like, they were, you know, that 97, 98, you know, they, they were... And then they went on in '98 to to win back to back. So, um, yeah, look, 
on us. Well, you know, like, yeah, we, everyone was shell shocked. Like, everyone's just like, um, you know, would, uh, the story was was would have been amazing. You know, from where we come, ninety because ninety six we effectively finished last as Fitzroy uh, left the competition. I think in ninety six. So, um, yeah, or ninety seven. But um, yeah, so yeah. that was phenomenal. Yeah. So, and I think that was the the only quarter of the season where we failed to score a goal. Now we had six, we kicked six behinds that that day, and you you pretty much describe all of them. There was another one where um, Cook, James Cook, uh, was was having a shot from about thirty out, and I was actually yeah. in the Consford stand, and I just something was rumbling in me that I just felt because a lot of a lot of the Bulldog supporters had left the ground to go and line up. These were the days where you lined up the ground final <laughs> ticket. And I just felt oh, we're being outnumbered here, and it just felt that yeah. some of the tide was turning. And as yeah. I was lining up for a goal, you know, the, the MCG has these big circular windows or kind of frames, right. and the sun was just lowering, and it went straight through those gaps, and it just shone right in in Cook's eyes. And I just remember thinking, some the footy gods are against us here, and um, it's just, <laughs> and um, you know, yeah. the rest is history. But can you tell us through your actual? You, that you touched on that that behind that you kicked. Um, can you can, do you looking back say that actually in reflection the goal umpire was right or or did you kick that? Oh. <laughs> look, I, it went really high, like it just went so high that I actually thought it when I it went it was it was higher than the the, the goalposts, and I I thought it, I thought it was in, but um, he obviously thought it was out, so. Uh, Brad Johnson swears blue or black that it was a goal because he was on the goal line. And I honestly thought it was a goal. But, yeah, look, I, I, I was shocked. I was like, as you can see by my uh, – I, I think I left the F word out. But, um, yeah, so I, I was convinced it was a goal. But anyway, because it wasn't far out. It was probably only 20, 30 metres out. Might be 30 metres out. But it went really, really high. And I thought, uh, yeah, I thought it was a goal. But, Oh, jeez. <laughs> you bring your back nightmares. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to do that to you. That's all good. You had the best angle in the house of it. Um, and there's actually some yeah. drone footage. If, you get, if people are watching this, go back and have a look at the um, the YouTube clip of that. There's actually, just before they show you kicking it, there's a there's an actual drone taking a shot of it. So there's footage somewhere yes. if we can yeah. get a hold of it, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, recently, uh, um, Jeff Fennick had his match returned uh, against Zuma <laughs> Fennick. Later. Maybe we go back and we revise and we play North <laughs> in the St Kilda in the grand final the next week and take him down. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah. Um, so how much does luck play a part? I know you've spoken to Martin Flanagan about this in the past. How much does luck play a part in, in results? Yeah, look, it, it, it plays, a, plays a big part, um, but... You sort of got to make your own luck as a, as a playing group. Like you got to, you, um, you know, some like oh, there's games I watch the game and the ball goes one way, it goes the other way. And even today, you watch games of footy and you think everything's going to this particular side. Everything's, but they're working hard at it. They're attacking the ball. They, you know, I even look at the boys we played last week against Brisbane. Like clearly, vividly remember all our defenders just charging through and just leaving their opponent and just trying to get that ball and believing themselves that they can get the ball. So you got to attack. Um, sometimes attack's the best best way to defend. And if you know you can go and get it, go for it. You know what I mean? So and that's that's why I sort of think we did so well against Brisbane was maybe against St Kilda or probably a little bit. And then, you know, like you, you got to kick goals early. I think that's, that's a real crucial part of football that um, – You've got to put the score on the board early, and then all of a sudden it gives you confidence and go, okay, we're we're on we're on, on song here. Once you start kicking three or four behinds, the opposition can start kicking two goals straight. You think, geez, we you know we we we've got to start putting the goals on the board because that's it deflates the whole whole playing group. If a guy's thirty meters, twenty meters out in front of goal and he misses, um, yeah, it's because <laughs> then then. It, Another miss comes, another miss comes, another miss comes, another miss, and then you're just like, oh, geez, no one wants to have a shot at goal. Yeah, well, yeah, totally. Uh, well, look, 97, yeah. 98, 99, you know, they were they were almost years, particularly the 97, but, you know, those other two years we were, uh, you know, we were incredibly strong as well. And then we entered the, the 2000 season, and again, sort of our age profile of the club started to sort of yeah. change and, and get a little bit older, yourself included. Um, yeah. 
there was a famous game in 2000, Tony, that you were part of against the Bombers, and they were an undefeated Bombers team. Yeah. And yeah. Take us inside the rooms of that day of, of, of how strategically you guys um, were able to to win an incredible, un, you know, unwinnable match, as they called it. Yeah, look, you know, look, we, we sort of had a bit of a theme. Um, Plough would, 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 would have a few themes um, throughout the year, and, and at training we decided that we would, he might have taken that a little bit off Rodney Ead, who was sort of in 96 and flood back a bit. But we we were just, we were pretty much, look, players thought we the only way we could beat them by, by just changing things up. And we just, everyone just leave their opponents and would virtually give them the ball from the centre, like centre like center back if they had the ball. And everyone would charge towards our, our back line and take a spot, like trying to take a certain spot and, it sort of worked for about a quarter and a half or two quarters, and then they started coming back and started picking through. And then the very last quarter, players said, "Okay, we're just going to go back." And then everyone sort of knew it looked, you know, the vision. I almost clearly remember the vision was players are pushing back and they're showing these are the Bulldogs what they're doing. They're giving the ball around the middle midfield, and they just go zoning back into spots. We weren't too worried about, and we just thought they would just turn the ball over, which they did. And then we would sort of try and counter it, counter attack, and which we did. And um, so maybe, and then that last quarter, they they started getting on top of us in a bit mm. start of last quarter, or might have been third, towards the end of the third quarter. Then player said, "We go back to our own way we played the footy." Like so, we just went back, reverted back to, which was quite amazing because you you know like it was sort of like a different game plan straight away from one to another, and then. We were lucky enough to win, and you know, I think Chris Grant kicked a really crucial goal. Uh, Steve Collin might have as well, and we won, and that was that was amazing because you know they they were the only team that looked very very close to being not only the premiers but also go through the whole year undefeated. Yeah, it must have given you guys an incredible amount of belief. But it, it, the year didn't end up um, as we'd planned. And I guess you know that sort of. Yeah. Famous, you know, open window sort of phase started to close a little bit, you know, as towards the end of your career there. Um, yeah. You, um, I guess you, you never played in a premiership. Are there any are there any regrets um, around that, Tony? Or do you look back and, and sort of feel a sense of gratitude of what you achieved and the players you were, you played with? Yeah, look, obviously, 97, you, you sort of feel that, you know, and, you know, we still talk about it now. You know, when I speak to Jose Ramiro or Paul Dimitino, we we're very close, or Scott Wine, or and we had such a, a physical side in '97. A side like that would win a win a premiership because we sort of everyone had a role to play, I think, and you know, and that we weren't. There was a bit of 2016 about us in '97. Like we had, we had a strong resolve and strong belief in ourselves, but we um, we. Look, we just took everything before us. Like nothing, nothing was going to stop us. You know, like we were just on a mission, and uh, and then we had a strong belief. I can remember. I think it was the last game of the year we played Hawthorne, and they tried to upset us and tried to, you know, virtually you know, get a couple of blokes to the tribunal, which they might have did because I think I remember. I think in '97, like Paul Dimitrino, Matthew Depp might have been, and one other might have been Danny Sun. I'm not sure. I was sitting in the stands, so we had a few guys out suspended right. as well. But what, what a you know, what, what a difference those that trio may have made. Yeah, and 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 they were sitting in the stands, absolutely gutted after the game. And we don't blame them for what what happened, but um, you know, sides would start coming out and start testing us and try and suck us in, you know. And um, unfortunately, those probably three did. Um, they were probably a bit unlucky, but I can't specifically clearly remember what they actually did wrong, but. Um, yeah, look, we we were, we were you know, I remember our, our last game at Noble that was in 97. And yes. You could you could have the best side of the competition playing, which were probably, they might have been West Coast at the time, which, and we were never going to lose. Like, we, it's just, and it's almost like the Bulldogs have got this bit of DNA in them, even to now. Like, I, I knew they were going to beat Brisbane on Thursday night because that DNA comes out and we, we rarely get, lose three in a row and, um, you know, it's a long year to go, but um, if you if you got that that G and D and that real um, determination not to let uh, the opposition get away, um, but yeah, ninety seven clearly. I mean, 
that's certainly a regret, obviously, because I, I I thought we were well and truly the best side of the competition the whole year, and um, you know we we just we just played on the edge, and I, I remember playing on uh, sides that they 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 feared us. They they said, oh, geez, we're just going to be in for a torrid day. You know, I remember playing on Rosie Jones one day for St Kilda, and he just like he said, "You tagged me again." I said, "Yep," and, and he just like threw his hands up and he goes, oh, "I've got no oh. chance." Like he, really? he virtually gave up, you know. Like and uh, um, you know, and that's that's you know, like that was a <laughs> we're we're a pretty mean side. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and yeah. Doug, Doug said that about you know the side, but you in particular, you know, when when your back was to the wall or you know the opposition were were, were throwing things at you and the, the the crowd got against you, you rose to an, another gear. He said a sixth gear. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, you know, what inspired you in those moments and who were sort of the opponents that quite tried to get under your, your skin that you absolutely loved to play against? Oh, I don't think a player got under – any player in 97 got under my skin. I think I was the one getting under their skin because my my role was to tag players, you know. You know, I'd line up against Anthony Kudafides, who's six foot four. Um, you know, uh, Shane Crawford, Michael Voss. I, I, I'd say to player – let me play on the best players I wanted. I challenged myself to beat the best players, and that's what I wanted to do. And um, my, my role, I really understood team football because my role, I had a specific role to do, and that's all I wanted to do. I, I didn't care about getting – I think Paul Kelly was a classic example. I, I think I played against him, at, and we back then we were playing at Optus Oval, Princess Park back in the day, and I think I played on Kelly, and um, I think I had two kicks, two marks, two handles, and two goals. I got two brown low votes. Brilliant. And I think Cal's only had about you know, half a dozen possessions. I, I crawled him. But I, I just felt like um, I, I just wanted to beat anyone. Like anyone who wanted to play it, I was just, I was just mean. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I just, I, I was ferocious at, at the, at the opponent, at the player. But well, we did, Jose, Paul, uh, Jose, Paul, Dim Turner and I, we, we would, you know, we would charge up to James Heard before a game and try and put him on his backside. And here I am starting on the bench. So we just took that upon ourselves because we just, uh, we wanted everyone to hate us. And I loved the fact that I was booed because um, I thought to myself, well, we're really not only getting under the opposition skin, but even the supporters. So, um, you know, like you, you, you play to your strengths and that was my strength. And um, I know I've always re- asked, I remember asking play, who have I got? The day after a game, or like, or Monday after, after set that game, I said, "Who?" He would sort of say, uh, "Who?" You, I reckon I, I would say, "I, I'll, I'll go Wayne Campbell." He'd just say, "No, you go Matthew Knights." I'm like, "Well," so like he would specifically um, work out a formula to to which player I could play on, and um, yeah, and I, I really enjoyed that challenge because. It was about beating that direct opponent. Um, it wasn't always. I didn't always win. I remember I, I played on Ben Cousins once, and uh, uh, and I beat him pretty well at Whitno. But the second time round, he, he fixed me up at, at in Perth, and you know, he was an outstanding player. And you know Michael Voss and guys like that. And it was a it was a privilege and a thrill just to play against those guys because they're all legends of the game. Shane Crawford, and uh, I'm just looking at a <laughs> at a photo. <laughs> Which um, I'll I'll, set, I'll show it to you. It's yeah, quite please. funny, but there's a photo of me sitting on a couch, and I'll ha- you can have a look at this. I don't know if you've got it or not. Yes, <laughs> but there's me oh. sitting there with a the pipe under, the, and um, <laughs> Macca gave it to me, uh, who I uh, who I saw, and and I, I it was in a it was in a paper, and I I got it got him to. Sketch it again for me. So there's Ben Cousins, Michael Voss, Crawford, Kelly, Lawrence. <laughs> now Lawrence, but, yeah, but anyway, the, my brown low and my two. He missed another medal there because I won two gardeners. But anyway, and there's me sitting with my pipe and Matthew Knights on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's magnificent. <laughs> so that, that's 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 on my bedroom wall. So not my bedroom, my Landry wall. So I, you know, like you know, you got to take. Take the Mickey out of yourself, you know, um, because yeah, that's that's footy, you know, and um, I just think that's really funny. <laughs> We've all got some scalps there, that's that's for sure. And look, look, the yeah. 
sitting in the outer as you know as a fan all these years and watching you i just thank my lucky stars that i was a bulldog you were a bulldog and i was a bulldog fan because i think if i wore different colors you would have been the most frustrating annoying player to watch but um I hate it. I hate hate it. It, but, but having you on our side we just we just rode every bump and and, and um and waved with you and just loved it so yeah. did, did you did you feel that sort of that love and passion from the dogs fans behind you oh yeah yeah no doubt i mean no doubt like um yeah yeah, well, I was quite resilient back then as well. I mean, still am quite resilient, but you know, like, um, yeah, like I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, I, I got five weeks for hitting Matthew Nice and Craig McRae actually. I, I got a few weeks for clawing at his face, apparently. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, look, you, know, you can't do it these days, and um, we certainly, and I certainly, you know, uh, tested the boundaries of the litter of the of a, you know the AFL and what have you. So, but, you know, I guess we just needed to do that to become, you know, especially 97, because that was the year when we, you know, we, we got so close and um, yeah, but um, look, it, you know, it, in saying it was, a, you know, opportunity missed, but it was, it was a great year too, because um, along the way, you know, we, we had a lot of fun and, you know, we, we, we were such a tight group of players that um, um, we just felt like no one could beat us, you know, we were so, was so tight and there was so many I still got you know a photo of, of us when we have our last ever game at Witten Oval and I look at the names and I think wow there's some really really great players there and you know um underrated players too because a lot of them did their job for the for the side. Yeah you well I mean look you mentioned Matty Dent before and you know there was Yeah Vic Martin guys like that you know James Cook Simon Mitten Connell you know obviously Windy and uh yeah, see, Critty, you know, just a, a just an unbelievable defence that would just <laughs> Paddy Southern like they wouldn't let they wouldn't let anything through. You know, it's so so good. No, absolutely. So tell us over the you know you, you've spoken of ninety seven a lot over the course of your career, and um, you know who are the players your, your teammates that you absolutely um, you know just loved and adored you know, not only for their talent but just for them, them being teammates. Who who are the ones that stand out to you, Tony? Oh look, I, I, the best, probably the best player. Like it's funny because I didn't see Doug Hawkins. I saw it from '86 onwards, but '85 he was, and then he did his knee in '86. But he he was just an iconic player. So I didn't see the best of Doug. But then for me, the best team player I played with was I want to say team player. He was just a he was just a inspirational captain and Scott Wine. Um, and obviously you got you know. Chris Chris Grant, who was an incredibly good player. Scott West, who won so many best and fairest. You know, Brad Johnson, probably a little bit towards the end. I, I sort of got him at the start of his career, but he was developing an amazing player. Rowan Smith, who played 300 games. Um, you know, there's so many, so many good players. Uh, but I'd say probably Windy, for me, was the one who, um, you know, like he, he just, you know, he'd have to stand in the hole with Tony Lockers coming out the other end. You know, Doug was just... A, Doug was an amazing player, but also an incredibly great teammate. And he cared so much for um for you, for you as a teammate. Um, yeah. So, and obviously, you know, like Jose Ramiro and Paul Dimitino, you know, come from probably other clubs and who fit who played some really significant roles at the club. So, and we become really close mates. Absolutely. Well, you've named the who's who there of, of Bulldog supporters and of, of players, and I dare say you could go on and on. Um, Tony, which is fantastic to say. And look, your career ended without a premiership, but how was yeah. it for you as a dad to um to be able to sit in the grandstand in 2016 and and to see Tom, your son, go up and um, and represent the club that you you know you you sweat and and bled for and um, take yeah. a premiership medal. You talked about you know other people winning winning a medal and how that's more important. Was how was that moment? Yeah, look, I mean, and that's that's it. You know, like your players that you play to win a premiership, and and twenty sixteen, it was just it was quite surreal because I, um, I I knew we'd win it like a grand final day. Everything was just the momentum was incredible. Like the, the flow was was going. You know, like you just couldn't believe how well the story was incredible. Like just to you know to um, win our first final in Perth, which I actually attended and. I remember speaking to Anissa Groves, um, who was a trainer or my therapist at the club, 
And she said to me, we're going to win the flag. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, Eagles are red hot favourites to win the flag. And we, I think it was, we played him in an elimination final and we just absolutely thumped him. And then um, I, I thought, you're kidding yourself, you know, like, it was a great win, but I, I didn't think, you know, we were playing, going back to Melbourne, playing Hawthorne last year's premiers and being down at half time or half for the second quarter, I can't remember, but, or third quarter. And then we just started getting momentum back and then we just, we beat them. And then, um, and then obviously it was that famous game in, you know, again, it was a preliminary final. That was the game where I just sort of thought I wasn't sure yes. because I thought, yes. you know, we've lost so many preliminary finals and I, I, I was just such a incredibly head rush. It was just amazing. And then when we won that, I just knew we we're going to win the flag because um, that was a bit of a hoodoo to, to, to beat because oh, we played in so many prelims, you know, 10 years prior, we'll go back to 1992, um, such a long time ago. And for us just to win that and then I just thought – and then I, I remember – uh, Sydney, if you could stay with Sydney up to half time, you'll beat them because they started, they got out of the block for, and it was a bit, it was a bit, uh, it was very tight for most of the game, certainly the first half. And then I just specifically remember someone saying to me that, that uh, you can get Sydney if you stay with them for most of the game. And then, and in that last quarter, we exploded. And, um, you know, to see Pete can do what he did, you know. Tom Boyd, you know, and all, the whole group, you know, Tom, the midfield, Bont, you know, um, Jason Johannesson. Um, yeah, so you know, I'm only picking out a few there, but there's always a team effort, you know, like Zane Cordy playing forward, um, Fletcher Roberts, you know, playing his role as a defender. And again, you look at the side, you know, Clay Smith, guys like that, Luke Dowhouse, and you sort of think there was so much of 97 that I thought it was such a, comparison because it, everyone was a role player like there wasn't we didn't there wasn't you know probably Bont was wasn't even at his peak yet um he probably was to a degree but we, we no one stood out as a massive you know a buddy franklin or a luke hodge or you know a darren jarman it, it was such a team effort and that was the greatest the greatest thing and, and i'm convinced that's that's how you win premierships. I mean, uh, Geelong were probably a little bit different last year because they just destroyed Sydney. But, um, yeah, the, the, the team first and the role you play is the most important thing, I think, when it comes to finals. Yeah, well said. What you know, what a moment. And, and t- Tom getting up there and getting his, his medal, What describe that feeling as a dad watching that. Oh, look, I was, I was just over the moon. Like, I just, you know, like... I, in the rooms, oh, I've got this great video of me and him embracing and hugging, and you know we hug again, and uh, it was just incredible. It was just you know, I, I, <clears throat> it's it's one of those ones you want to bottle up, and and I remember on the night we we wherever the function was at exhibition building or something like that, I didn't want the night to go. I just wanted. We've all had those nights where we had so much fun that you just want to bottle everything up. And you want to press stop. You want to just stay in the moment. You don't want to. You don't want to things to get. You don't want the night to go too quick. You want to slow things down. But unfortunately, it just can't, it just goes into the next day. And um, I remember going to the ground the next day. And I actually couldn't physically get into the ground because I was getting supporters were coming up to me and just surrounding me, and pushing me back. And like, and I said to uh, my son Oliver at the time, I said, "We we got to go. We got to go home. We can't." It's just too many people. It's just crazy. It was just, it was just amazing. But um, that the rooms was incredible. It was just, it was just incredible. It was just, um, you know, I don't know what time we got out, but we pretty much went straight to the function, and um, it was such a, you know, to see so many people cry and people who, you know, to 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 us to witness a premiership, you know, it's a bloody hard thing to do, and um, you know, I hope St Kilda do it one day because. Um, you know, for those people who are still alive, who would love to see, who have never seen it, their side win a premiership, and they're probably the only team that haven't. Um, we don't care about interstate teams. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, like, you know, it's uh, it was incredible. Like, you just wanted to always always remember it on the night, just saying, oh, I want time to stop. I want everything to stop. But I couldn't because um, everyone was having such a great time, and it was great to see all the past players there and 
um, just sharing the emotions and the elation with them. And everyone was so happy. It was, it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. Yeah, we interviewed Choco Royal last week and he said the same. He was just in the rooms afterward and said probably the greatest night he's ever experienced from a footy perspective. Yeah. And just, you know, just said it was yeah. incredible. Um, and the pride That's that he felt, you know, you're you're pretty much explaining that as well, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, we are coming close to the end of um, of the podcast, Tony. We wanted to, um, yeah. to we always end with, um, with a quiz, a bulldog quiz. Now, um, this quiz is currently led by Dougie Hawkins. With uh, he's at the top of the, the leaderboard. We're going to give you uh, yeah. we're going to give you one minute. To <laughs> quiz. You you get a little bit of power here, Tony. You, you get to choose what the what the category is. I'm going to give you two categories. Yeah, you know which one you prefer here. So the first one is, and you've been speaking about this, the 2016 final series. You can choose yeah. if you'd like that, or um, Bulldogs at the Brownlow Medal. Which um, which would you prefer to uh, to have? Um. Uh, 2016. Final 2016. Final. Great choice. All right. Fantastic. Well, I'll start the clock after I um, ask the first question. All right. So good luck. As I said, Dougie's on top. <laughs> the top two people at the end of the year are going to go into the grand final head to head. So um, right. it, could be, it could be you, Tony. And we're playing for, and I know that you like your art. Um, uh, Noel Brazizi, who did the artwork for the, for the 2016 banner, is actually going to do a portrait of the player who wins. So you might get something on the awesome. wall next to uh, that trophy <laughs> art piece. All right, so good luck. All right, Tony. The, the, the first question is, Jake Stringer scored the most Bulldog goals in the 2016 final series. Is that true or false? False. Correct. It was Tory Dixon. Liam Picken won the club's best in, best in the finals award. Is that true or false? Best in finals? True. Correct. Tom Boyd's first goal of the grand final was scored on his left boot. True or false? Ooh, uh, I'll go false. That yeah, was true. Which player oh. passed the ball to Bontempelli in the, in the final quarter in the prelim against the Giants? Who kicked it to the Bont? Uh, uh... Was a defender. Um, you Jason your number? Johansson? It was JJ. Who scored yeah. the opening goal in the 2016 prelim that you were at? Uh, uh, I'll go Clay Smith. Correct. Callum Ward was subbed out of the prelim with after a knee from which player? Oh, uh, oh, God. I'm trying to think of Um Oh, Fletcher Roberts. No, it was Zane Cordy. And what unusual precise time, this is the last question on the siren, what unusual precise time was the first Bulldog goal scored in the grand final? What was the exact time on the, on the clock when it went through? It's a very unusual time, but it's significant to the Bulldogs. And 1954. <laughs> Correct. 19 minutes, 54 seconds. How incredible is that? Tony, <laughs> you have done incredibly well. Um, let me calculate your scores. And there it is, Tony. You've done incredibly well. Well done, mate. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Well, you know what? You haven't knocked off uh, Dougie, but what a, what a great effort. And 1954, is that, is that a, an unbelievably spooky Yeah, story? I remember that. I remember saying some say that, yeah. Oh, I love it. Absolutely. Well, before we let you go, um, Tony, we just wanted to say uh, thanks from the bottom of our heart. We did a, um, a a poll on the Western Bulldogs forum, which is 22,000 members, and we asked the question, who is the most famous Liberatore of all? I'm sure this has been... Oh, I think Tom's got me, mate. <laughs> I'm sure it's been debated at the uh, Liberatore uh, table. It actually isn't, Tom, believe it or not. Nonna has, t has tipped the scale. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Good. She's still alive going well, so 92. <laughs> Excellent. You made it onto the podium, Tony, on it. But that's the, that's the main thing. But, look, we want to say thank you. You're a, you're a Bulldog champion through and through. You're much loved. And we just want to say thank you for, for joining us on the kennel. Any final words to Bulldog supporters um, in terms of, uh, you know, how you want to be remembered and, 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 and your sort of messy, final message to the dog fans? Oh, look, you know, like, it, it's, it's so important to, I guess, you know, I, I, you know like... Uh, <laughs> I remember Jeff, one of Jeff Phoenix's favourite lines was "I love you all," and um, it, it's so apt for the uh, the people from the Western Sabres and the Bulldog supporters. And you know, like always, supporters, you know, never give up. Um, they'll find a way. Um, 
yes, it's yes, we'll do it the hard way often, going from eighth or you know, never in the top four. But um, that's that's us. That's our that's in our DNA. So um, yeah, I, I'm, and I'm you know I've just just remembered as someone who just gave everything for the club, and the club was the most important thing. And um, you know, and um, so wrapped up we, that I could, that I saw a premiership. Absolutely. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, no, Tony thanks, Liber Liberatore. Thank you, Pat. Awesome. Thank you.